if we're going to understand the circulatory system, how it operates, how it has evolved, and what constitutes a good design for it, we have to start with the energy costs of pumping fluids through them. Poissier's law gives us a powerful tool to explore this. Let's dive in. We're going to start by building an analogy between electrical current and blood flow. That's not so far-fetched as it might seem, because they're basically the same processes. In the case of electrical current, electrons are made to flow under the influence of a potential energy gradient, in this case voltage. The flow of current is limited by a resistance, and as electrons flow across this resistance, they can be made to do work. They may drive a pump, power a motor, light up a display, whatever. Even though the details differ in some obvious ways, blood flow through a tubular vessel is actually very similar to this. In blood flow, liquid is made to flow, also under the influence of a potential energy gradient, in this case pressure. This flow will be limited by some physical resistance, and as it flows, work can be done. In this instance, the resistance comes from the transfer of momentum to the vessel walls through viscosity, and the work done is the physical movement of blood through the vessel. Because of this fundamental similarity, we should be able to analogize the flow of blood through a vessel to the flow of electrical current through a resistor. In this instance, the mass flow of blood is analogous to the flow of electrical current. The difference of pressure is analogous to the difference of voltage, and the electrical resistance should be analogous to a so-called hydraulic resistance, which we'll designate as R sub H. In the case of electrical current, the current, voltage difference, and electrical resistance are related by Ohm's law. If the analogy of electrical current to blood flow is sound, we should therefore be able to write an equation of similar form that relates the mass flow of blood, the pressure difference, and the hydraulic resistance. Poissier's law lets us do just this. Pressure difference and flow are the easy parts, they're direct terms of the equation. The trick is to calculate the hydraulic resistance. We have the mass flow and the pressure difference, and this means that the remaining terms in Poissier's law are equivalent to the inverse of the hydraulic resistance, 1 over R sub H. Let's just state this explicitly. Hydraulic resistance is equivalent to this ratio. There are a couple of obvious things to point out here. First is that the hydraulic resistance is directly proportional to the length of the vessel. The longer the vessel is, the greater will be the hydraulic resistance. We can say a similar thing for the viscosity. Pushing more viscous fluids through a pipe will invoke a greater hydraulic resistance than pushing less viscous fluids through. And there is an inverse relationship between the hydraulic resistance and the radius. But again, we emphasize the disproportionate effect of radius. Hydraulic resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. And this means that doubling the radius will reduce the hydraulic resistance by a factor of 1 over 2 to the fourth, or 1 16th. It's all very nice to be able to calculate the hydraulic resistance of a single vessel, but circulatory systems consist of networks, specifically ramifying networks of circular blood vessels. We therefore need to extend our analysis of the physics of blood flow through a single vessel to the flow through networks of vessels, or if you prefer, networks of hydraulic resistances. Here is just such a network that is analogous to the ramifying network of vessels drawn above, with each discrete vessel represented as a hydraulic resistance. It's obvious that these networks can get very complicated very fast, so we need some simple means of analyzing the behavior of them. To do that, we first need to establish a bit of vocabulary. First, we can speak of generations of branching as if we were talking about generations in family lineages. So, for example, there is a root vessel that we can call the parent vessel. In a simple dichotomous branching network, the parent gives rise to two so-called daughter vessels. We could carry this on, of course. Each daughter vessel can be a parent vessel herself, 
and she could give rise to two of her own daughter vessel, which would be the granddaughters to the parent vessel. That itself doesn't help us make it any less complicated, but it does allow us to quantify it in terms of branching level. So, for example, we could designate the root vessel as having a branching level of number zero. The first daughter generation will then be branching level one, the next will be branching level two, then to branching level three, and so on. The simple thing this lets us do is write an equation for the number of vessels in any particular branching level. Specifically, the number of vessels is equal to the number 2 raised to the power of the branching level. So, at branching level 0, there are 2 to the 0, or 1 vessels at level 1. There are 2 to the 1 power, or 2 vessels, then 2 to the 2 power, 2 to the 3 power, and so forth, all the way until we get to the ultimate branching level, the capillaries. We can also use these branching networks to say something about the distribution of blood amongst the daughter vessels, and even things like how fast blood is flowing through them. Here's a simple branching element consisting of one parent and two daughter vessels. Let's start laying out some properties. The parent vessel has a radius of r sub l, and each daughter vessel has a radius of r sub l plus 1. l, remember, is the branching level. We can calculate a cross-section area for each. Given these vessels are usually circular in cross-section, this cross-section area will be pi times the radius squared. Okay, what can we tell from this? Let's start with how blood flow through the parent vessel is distributed into the daughter vessels. We know from the principle of continuity that the mass flux through branching level 1 must equal the total mass flux through branching level L plus 1. With this, we can calculate the mass flow of blood that is carried in each daughter vessel. Specifically, if we suppose that the hydraulic resistances of the two daughter vessels are equal, each daughter vessel will carry one half of the total flow through the parent vessel. There's no reason to suppose, of course, that flows through both daughter vessels have to be equal. If the two daughter vessels have different hydraulic resistances, for example, more blood would flow through the daughter vessel with a smaller hydraulic resistance. Even in this circumstance, though, the principle of continuity is strict. The flow through both daughter vessels must add up to the flow through the parent vessel. We can also calculate the average velocity of blood through the vessels. We start by dividing the mass flow rate of blood by the blood density, which lets us calculate flow as a volume flow rate. This gives us units of meters cubed per second, or something dimensionally similar. Dividing volume flow rate by vessel cross-section area gives us a number for velocity with units of meters per second. Work out the units. Volume flow rate in meters cubed per second divided by cross-section area in meters squared. This is, of course, the average velocity through the vessel. It does not account for the parabolic velocity profile within the vessel, which we have already discussed. Blood velocity in the vessel center is going to be greater than this average velocity, while velocity toward the vessel periphery will be less. If we know the average velocity, though, we can calculate the parabolic velocity profile from this. Okay, that was pretty hairy. It's got us to a very useful place, though, because the combination of the principle of continuity, along with a way to get to the velocity profile for all the vessels in a network, lets us calculate the shear forces operating throughout the network. And this points the way to uncovering the deep design principles that underlie the architecture of blood vessel networks. Before we get to that, though, let's have a look at the architecture of some actual blood vessel networks.